Good evening, uh, and welcome to the Pace School of Performing Arts. I'm Jorge Cuchero. I'm the executive director of the school. I don't usually write things on paper. I usually like to just talk, but um, this is a great week at Pace University. Um, it's the presidential inaugural week, and we're extremely honored. I'm going to walk around this because it seems like it's getting my way. Um, we're extremely honored to have the new and eighth president of Pace University in the house today, <laughs> President Marvin Krislov. Please give President Krislov a hand. For the next 60 minutes or so, we're going to be entertained by some really spectacular work by our very talented students, both in the undergraduate school, which is Pace School of Performing Arts, and in the university's graduate program, which is the Actors Studio School. Um, and I think you will be incredibly impressed by their work. Um, I, I also just want to take a moment to tell you about the journey of the Pace School of Performing Arts. I came here six years ago. Um, at that time, it was the Department of Performing Arts. And we created a, a, a mandate to make our school one of the national leaders in higher education at the undergraduate level. Um, and we did that by, by doing several really, really key things. Um, we re rewrote all our curriculum. We rolled out exciting, cutting-edge programs. We branded the school both nationally and internationally at every opportunity we could take. And there was a name to this. There was a name, one, to graduate all students who went through PPA in four years. And I can tell you that's we're just about there. And the other one is to make this one of the most sought after schools in the planet. I don't know where Wayne is, but he says in the galaxy. Um, <laughs> but we'll go with in the planet. Um, so we're in, what's that? Galaxy. Galaxy is gone. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> So we are incredibly proud of that, and I want to thank every, I see so many administrators who have made this happen and helped us along the way, but I want to particularly take this opportunity to thank our students, our staff, our faculty. You guys are the absolute best, and uh, you know, as the recent song goes, um, PPA, you get the, what does it go? You get the job, you get the job done, right? Is that what it is? Yeah, so thank you everybody. Um, President Krislov, I just want to say one thing uh, from PPA. We are incredibly thrilled you are here. If we can help you in any way to make this, we, we really do believe that this school, this university can be a beacon of progressive thought and ideas and discourse and can be a leader in the arts, in business, in, in the sciences, in entrepreneurial in, uh, in innovation, anything we can do. We're here for you. Bienvenido. Let's get this started. I'm going to, I have a great, it's my great honor to now introduce the illustrious dean of the, of the Actors School, of the Actors uh, Studio School. Uh, you guys know him from inside the Actors Studio, Mr. James Lipton. You want to do that? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, the university asked me to, to prepare a three-minute welcome to President Krislov for this occasion. <laughs> I regret to say that is not possible. <laughs> three minutes to sum up this remarkable life and career. Cicero employed a rhetorical device called apophysis, which means literally pointedly saying something by methodically laying out what you will not mention. <laughs> so I will not mention Marvin Krislov's 12 years as a student at Yale and Oxford earning bachelor's and master's degrees in economics, political science, modern history, and a law degree at Yale Law School, or his distinguished record in private legal practice and public service in the Clinton White House as special counsel, or his 10 groundbreaking years as president of Oberlin College. No, <laughs> I, I'll leave that to the documentarians and focus instead on a quality he possesses that can be summed up 
in one word, leadership. Leadership is a word frequently employed, but too infrequently explored. What does it mean to lead? To be the first one in the parade? Yes. But that poses the next question. Where is the parade going? I've spent the last 23 years trying to answer that question with hundreds of leaders in the world of the arts. And I think we've come up with a common denominator. True leaders take us where we have never gone before. I was recently privileged to conduct an interview with President Christopher Pace magazine, and I will refer you to it for his eye-opening answers. But within the space of my three minutes, which are nearly consumed, <laughs> I'll try to sum up what I observed. When he was vice president and general counsel of the University of Michigan before going to Oberlin, he led Michigan's defense of affirmative action all the way to the Supreme Court and won, opening a path to the future for the university and for the nation. And in responding to my questions about where he wanted to lead Pace, it was clear that he was on a new journey to uncharted territory, that place where ancient cartographers indicated the end of the known world with a drawing of a sea monster and the warning, here be dragons. Which brings us to the final word that describes leadership, courage. I'll leave it to President Krislov to speak henceforward for himself with one request from me and all of us. Please take us with you. All right, let's get this party started.
I'm sorry. But I don't want to be a, an emperor. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone, and a good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful, but we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world, millions of despairing men, women, and little children, victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed, the bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die, and the power they took from the people will return to the people, and so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men, with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines, you are not cattle, you are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate, only the unloved hate, the unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, don't fight for slavery, fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke it is written, the kingdom of God is within man, not one man nor a group of men, but in all men, in you. You, the people, have the power. The power to create machines, the power to create happiness. You, the people, have the power to make this life free and beautiful, to make this life a wonderful adventure. Then in the name of democracy, let us all unite!
Yeah. 
Oh, are they wonderful? So, those are our undergraduate students from the Pace School of Performing Arts. I want to give a special hand specifically to our costume designers who worked really, really hard on the dance pieces. If you would give them a hand, that'd be great. Um, I now want to introduce my colleague, Andreas Manolikakis. Um, he is the chair of the Actors Studio Drama School. Take it away, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me start with congratulating these artists and the faculty and, of course, the leadership of the school for this fantastic talent and work that they just uh, show us here. Now I would like to join our, um, uh, Mr. James Lipton, our Dean Emeritus and founder of the Actors Studio Drama School, and my colleague Jorge Cacheira into welcoming you to Pace University. Uh, the Actors Studio Drama School, uh, when it was founded by James Lipton in 1994, uh, had a goal, and that goal was to offer to students under an academic environment the best uh, a representation of the Stanislavski system, Vachtangov system, and the Acto Studio. And since then, uh, that's what we're doing. We are the largest MFA program, Jorge, in the cosmos. I would go even further. <laughs> <laughs> and, and since we came here at Pace University in 2006, uh, we were able to improve uh, this goal that we have and we're hoping under your leadership to go even further with that. So I'm not going to go uh, to say anything more. I mean it's strange for me in front of the founder of the program to talk about the program. <laughs> but uh, now what you're going to see here is uh, two little sketches. Uh, the first one is by two actresses that they have already graduated from the program. And the second one is directed by a director of the program, and it's acted by two actresses that they're all these uh, now third-year students, and they presented that work last year in their second year. So enjoy it. Thank you, and welcome.
Well, how does it feel to be an old married lady? Oh, it's too soon to ask me that. I mean, goodness, we have only been married about three hours, haven't we? Oh, we've been married exactly two hours and 26 minutes. My, it seems like longer. <laughs> no, it isn't hardly half past six yet. It seems like later. I guess it's because it starts getting dark so early. It does at that. The nights are going to be pretty long from now on. I mean, I mean, well, it starts getting dark early. Yeah, I didn't have any idea what time it was. Everything was so mixed up. I sort of don't know where I am or what it is all about. Getting back from the church and then all those people changing all my clothes and everybody throwing things and all. Goodness, I don't see how people do it every day. <laughs> do what? Get married. When you think of all of these people all over the world getting married just like it wasn't anything. Chinese people and everybody just like it was nothing. <laughs> Let's not think about people all over the world. Let's don't think about a lot of Chinese. <laughs> We've got something better to think about. I mean, what do we care about them? I know, but I just sort of got to thinking of them. All of them, all doing it everywhere, just like it wasn't anything. And, and, and getting married, you know, it's such a big thing to do. Oh, it makes you feel funny. And, and they are doing it everywhere, just like it wasn't anything. And how does anybody know what's going to happen next? Let them worry. We don't have to. We know darn well what's going to happen next. <laughs> I mean, well, we know it's going to be great. Well, we know we're going to be happy, don't we? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Only you think of these people, you have to sort of keep thinking. And it makes you feel funny. An awful lot of people that get married, they think it's going to be great and everything. It doesn't turn out so well. And I guess they almost have thought it was going to be great. Come on. This is no way to start a honeymoon with all this <laughs> thinking going on. <laughs> Look at us. All married and everything done. I mean, the wedding all done and all. Oh, it was nice, wasn't it? Did you really like my veil? Oh, you looked great, just great. <laughs> I'm so glad Ailey and Louis, they looked perfectly lovely, didn't they? I'm so glad that they did finally decide on pink because they looked perfectly lovely. Listen, I want to tell you something. When I was standing up there in that old church waiting for you to come up, and I saw those two bridesmaids, I thought to myself, I thought, I never knew Louise could look like that. I thought she'd knock anybody's eye out. I think your old lady... 
I think your mother is swell. <laughs> and Ellie, and your father. What's all this talk? Don't tell me, I've seen it happen. Lots of people that get made, they think it's going to be great and everything, and it all goes to pieces because people don't like people's families or something like that. Don't tell me, I've seen it happen. Honey, what is all this? What are you getting all angry about? Hey, look, this is our honeymoon. What are you trying to start a fight for? I guess you're feeling sort of nervous. Me? What do I got to be nervous about? I mean, I'm not nervous. <laughs> you know, lots of times they say that girls get sort of nervous and yippy on account of thinking about I mean, it's like you said, okay? Things are also sort of mixed up in everything right now. But afterwards, it'll be all right. I mean, well, look, honey, you don't look any too comfortable. Don't you want to take your hat off? And let's don't ever fight, ever. Will we? I'm sorry, I was cross. I did feel a little bit funny, all sort of mixed up thinking of all these people all over the world getting married all the time. And you can't blame a person for thinking, can you? Yes, let's don't ever, ever fight. We won't be like a whole lot of them. We won't fight or be nasty or anything, will we? You bet your life we won't. I guess I will take this darn hat off. It kind of presses. Just put it up on the rack, will you, dear? Oh, it looks good on you. No, I mean... <laughs> Do you really like it? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. I know that this is the new style and everything like that, and it's probably great. I don't know anything about things like that. I know I like that hat, like that blue hat you had. Gee, I like that hat. Really? Well, that's nice. That's lovely. The first thing you say to me as soon as you got me on the train away from everything and my family that you don't like my hat? The first thing you say to your wife that you think she has terrible taste in hats? That's nice, isn't it? Honey, I never said any such thing. All I said you don't seem to realize that this hat costs two wenty. $22. And this old horrible blue thing you think you're so crazy about, it costs three ninety nine. I don't give a darn what it costs, okay? I just said I like the blue hat, that's all I said. I don't know anything about things like that, okay? What do I know about the new styles? What do I know about women's hats? Too bad you didn't marry somebody who gets the kind of hat you want. <laughs> hat costs three ninety five. Why didn't you marry me? Love her tasty hat. Why didn't you marry her? Honey, for heaven's sakes. No, why didn't you marry her? All we ever done since we got on this train is just talk about her. Here I've sat and sat and just listened to you saying how wonderful Louise is. I still hope that's nice, getting me on a train away from everything and then raving about Louise in front of my face. Why didn't you marry her? Oh, oh, she would have jumped at the chance. There are so many people asking her to marry them. It's too bad you didn't marry her. You would have been much happier. <laughs> Listen. Baby, while you're talking about things like that, why didn't you marry Joe Brooks? I suppose he could have given you all the $22 hats you wanted, I suppose. I'm not sorry I didn't. There, Joe Brooks wouldn't have waited until he got me on the train away from everything and that sneered at my tasting clothes. Joe Brooks wouldn't ever hurt my feelings. Joe Brooks has always been fond of me. Yeah? He's fond of you? He's so fond of you, he didn't even send you a wedding present, okay? That's how fond of you he was. I happen to know he's the way on business, and as soon as he comes back, he's going to give me anything I want for the apartment. Listen, I don't want anything he gives you in our apartment. Anything he gives you, I will throw right out the window. That is what I think of your friend Joe Brooks. And how do you know where he's been and what he's going to do? Has he been writing to you? I suppose my friends can't correspond with me. I didn't hear there's any law against that. Well, I suppose they can't. What do you think about that? I'm not going to have my wife getting a bunch of letters from a cheap traveling salesman. He is not a cheap traveling
German salesman. He is not. He gets a wonderful salary. So where did you hear <laughs> that? He told me so himself. Oh, I see. He told you so himself. He told you so himself. You have all the right to talk about Joe Bruce. You and your friend Louise. All you ever talk about is Louise. I care about Louise. I just thought she was friends of yours. That's all. That's why I've even noticed her. Well, you certainly took a lot of notice of her today <laughs> on our wedding day. You said yourself you were waiting in the church and you just kept thinking of her. Right up at the altar, right in the presence of God, and all you ever thought about was Louise. <laughs> Listen. Honey, I never should have said anything like that, okay? How does anybody know what kind of crazy things come into their head when they're standing up there waiting to get married? I was just telling you that because it was so kind of crazy. I thought that it'd make you laugh. I know I get mixed up today, too. I told you that. And everything is so strange and everything, and me thinking of all these people all over the world. <laughs> I know you get me stuck. Only I did think when you kept talking about how beautiful Louise looked, you did it with malice and forethought. Oh no, I never did anything with malice and forethought. I was just telling you that because I thought that it'd make you laugh. Well, it didn't. No, I know it didn't. It certainly did not. Baby, we, we ought to be laughing too. Hell, honey lamb. This is our honeymoon. What is the matter? I don't know. We used to squabble a lot when we were going together. And then engaged and everything. Then I thought everything would be sort of different when we were married. But now I feel so sort of strange, so sort of alone. Well, you see, sweetheart, we're not really married yet. I mean, things will be different afterwards. Well, I mean, we haven't been married very long. No. Well, we haven't got much longer to wait now. I mean, we'll be in New York in about 20 minutes. Then we could have dinner and, and sort of see what we feel like doing. Or, I mean, is there anything special you want to do? What? Like, do you want to go to a show or something? Why? <laughs> Whatever you like. I, I didn't think people went to theaters and things on there. I mean... I've got a couple of letters I must simply write tonight. Don't let me forget. Oh. You're going to write letters tonight. You see, with all the excitement and everything, I was perfectly terrible. I never did thank poor old Mrs. Sproul for her very school. And I never did a thing about those book ends the McMaster spent. It's just too awful of them. I've got to write them this very night. And when you're finished, maybe I can get you a magazine or a bag of peanuts. I wouldn't want you to be bored. As if I could be bored with you, silly. <laughs> bored. What I thought, I thought when we got in, we could go right up to the Biltmore. <laughs> anyways, leave our beds, have a little dinner in the room, kind of quiet, and then do whatever we want. Or I mean, let's go right up there from the station. That we are going to the Biltmore. Oh. I just love it. The twice we've stayed in New York, we've always stayed there. Papa and Mama and Ellie and I. And I was crazy about it. I sleep so well there. I go right off the slip the minute I put my head on the pillow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you do. <laughs> At least I mean, way up high, it's so quiet. We might go to some show or other tomorrow instead of tonight. Don't you think that would be better? Yes, I think it might. You don't have to write any of those letters tonight, do you? I don't suppose they would get there any quicker than if I wrote them tomorrow. Yeah. And we won't ever fight, ever, will we? No, not ever. I don't know what made me do like that. It all got, got sort of funny, sort of like a nightmare. Me thinking of all these people getting married and so many of them. And everything supports us on account of fighting and everything. But I don't want to be like that. But we won't be, will we? Well, you 
such a life we want. We will go pieces, we will fight. It will be all different now we are married. It will be all lovely. Reach me down my head, will you, sweetheart? It's time, I was putting it on. I'm sorry you don't like it. <laughs> I do so like it. Well, you said you didn't. You said you thought it was perfectly terrible. I never said any such thing. You're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I might be crazy. Thank you very much. But this isn't what you said. It's not a big thing. It's just a little small thing. But it's pretty funny to think that you've gone and married somebody who says that you have perfectly terrible taste in hats and then goes and says you are crazy besides. Now, honey, I never said any such thing, okay? Why, I love the hat. The more I look at it, the better I like it. I think it's great. Well, this isn't what you said before. Honey, stop it, will you? What do you want to start all this for again? I love the damn hat. I mean, <laughs> I love the hat! <laughs> I said I think it's great, that's all I said. Do you really? Do you honestly? I'm glad. <laughs> oh, I would hate you not like my head. It would be sort of such a bad start. Well, I think it's great. Now that we've got that settled, for heaven's sake. Oh, baby. Baby lamb. We're not going to have any bad starts. Look at us. We're on our honeymoon. Pretty soon we'll be regular old married people. I mean, in a few minutes we'll be getting into New York. Then we can have dinner, and then everything will be all right. I mean, here we are married. Here we are. Yes, here we are. <laughs>